SoundCloud. Okay, so we are recording at this time, and we want to welcome everyone for this beginning of the first of three series of Music of the Show. Our host and educator and teacher, Tamara Freeman, uh, Dr. Tamara Freeman, and make that correction. And we are thrilled that she is going to present, and we're going to learn a lot. So Tamara, why don't I give it over to you and share the experience that you played. Bob, thank you for being such a wonderful co-host and um, for organizing all the wonderful lectures that we're sponsoring at Temple Israel and JCC in Ridgewood. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first of three programs, actually interactive programs, about music of the Holocaust. You've heard me speak um, at great length about music of the Jewish people um, who suffered during the Holocaust. But in this three-part series, I'm going to be um, sharing with you the music and the situations, the history of other populations who were persecuted. The songs all have two important things in common. They represent solace and spiritual resistance. On the first screen, we see the very familiar Yuda patch that the Jewish people wore in the ghettos and concentration camps. But underneath it is an upside down brown triangle. This is the patch worn by the gypsy people during the Holocaust. And this evening, we're going to delve into their lives during this terrible, tragic time. During the evening, uh, we will have a chance to be interactive we'll have a chance to learn how to sing one of the um, most iconic songs from this time period. Um, during the course, during the class, I'm going to be pausing for five to time Rita. and asking for your reflections or your thoughts, your reactions. I'm just gonna sit quietly and um, ask you to raise your hands and then I'll, I'll ask you to speak. So we will have some time for some quiet and uh, to, to share some thoughts with each other. Uh, one of the reasons why I'd like to share music of other persecuted people is to help us understand better the traumas that other people felt, to feel the empathy for other populations. And this evening we are mostly going to be delving into the tragedy of transgenerational trauma that is how the trauma of the Holocaust made an imprint in the psychology of the following generations. So this, my slides do not want to move just one second. Let me see if I can get this to go. So Bob, are you sure that you've hosted me? I have, I'll double check it to make sure. Okay. Ah, here we are. You should be all right. Okay, good. Okay, here we go. So this evening, our program will go as follows. I'm going to be playing um, a piece of music, some prelude music by Kasriel Broida, a composer from the Vilna Ghetto. And I'll be playing on my 1935 Josef Bausch viola that was made in Berlin and was rescued from the Holocaust. I'm going to be featuring some music by the composer David Begelman from the Loge Ghetto, um, more accu accurately pronounced in Polish as Wodz. We're going to be delving into the music of the gypsies, both the archival music composed in Auschwitz and modern music of our time. Toward the end, we're going to be reflecting on all the things that we've learned by studying an art piece by um, a gypsy Holocaust survivor named Chea Stroika. And then we're going to finish with concluding remarks and discussion. I begin by playing a piece by Kasperl Broido called simply Ghetto. And Broido writes the following text. We're standing by the walls with depressed hearts, 
with idle hands like a weeping willow. Eyes are looking sorrowfully and sink deep into the distance and cares remain in them, eternity. It's hard to see the world through narrow walls. The sunshine has already been hidden by the ghetto walls. Then you see everything as in a dream. It shines as on the truth, the big world. Ghetto, I'll never forget you. Woe is your heartfelt, your sad song. Ghetto, I see your tears, your fatigue and your pain. Ghetto, what is the future? What is the future? In your small ghetto streets, I am conf confined. The heart is so sad, and while I understand that it hurts, yet I still love you so. Ghetto, I will never forget you. In this piece, in ghetto, you're going to hear two notes side by side quite frequently. One of those notes is an A flat to a D. And it forms what's called a tritone. An interval of, of dissonance and, and um, struggle. And you're also going to hear these two notes. That's the ghetto theme, which you're going to hear a lot at the end. This is one of the longest songs to come out of the Shoah. When I play it, I think of it as a stream of consciousness. <laughs>
by the end of this evening, I hope you feel a, a connection with these four people who are pictured here. In the upper left-hand corner of your screen is Margita Makolova, an Auschwitz survivor of gypsy descent. To the right of your screen on the top is Dr. Petra Gelbart, her aunt and her parents were Holocaust victims. Directly underneath Dr. Petra Gelbart is Roger Moreno Rothgab. He is of Dutch and Gypsy descent and a composer who we will listen to in a few minutes. And in the lower left-hand corner is Chea Stoika, an artist who chronicled called What Happened in Auschwitz After the Shoah. I recently made a wonderful new friend at the Orangetown Jewish Center in Rockland County. Her name is Sally Zaifman. She shared with me the story of her father, Jack, of blessed memory, who survived Auschwitz and Dachau because of his talent as a tailor. In Jack Zeifman's book, which I can't recommend enough, Tailor Made for Life, he devotes chapter 18 to the gypsy people he observed in Auschwitz. I'd like to read a little bit of that with you. There was a whole section of Auschwitz which housed the gypsies. Unlike the other camps in Auschwitz, the gypsy men, women, and children were all kept together. Whole families were allowed to be with one another in the barracks. They were not even used for labor. These were the only prisoners in Auschwitz that were not put to work as slaves. Among the gypsies at Auschwitz, there was one young boy who was more beautiful than all the others. He was about 10 years of age. This young boy was not only stunning in his looks, but he had a grace and composure well beyond his years. Josef Mengele took notice of this young boy and adopted him, so to speak, almost as a pet. He commissioned the finest tailors in all of Europe to make the boy a miniature SS uniform exactly like that of Mengele in the boy's small size. Anywhere Mengele was found, there would be this young gypsy. Many things happened during the Holocaust beyond the imaginations of good and sane people. The execution of the handsome young gypsy boy in the exquisite uniform was merely one among them. He was executed right along with all the others in the same manner and at the same time. It was Mengele who gave the order. This 10 year old child whom he held as dearly as a son was ordered to the gas chambers as were all of the others. Sally, thank you for sharing this book with me. And I thank Jack Zaifman of Blessed Memory for recording his time during the Shoah so that we all may learn from him and never forget. Let's talk just uh, for a moment about the etymology of the word gypsy. The gypsies were a nomadic people originally from the Punjab region of Northern India. They migrated to Iran by the 14th century and reached European countries about by the 15th century. They were mistakenly believed to have come from Egypt hence the name Gypsy from Egypt, but they actually were from Northern India. The Germans called the 
gypsy people, zigoiner, which comes from the Greek word for untouchable. In Yiddish, they were referred to as zigeiner, but the proper word for this population of people is Roma or Sinti. The plight of the Roma during the Holocaust is very similar to the Jews. The Nuremberg laws, which were to cleanse the population of Germany and Austria, included the Roma and Sinti people. We don't know the exact number of Roma who perished, but it's somewhere between 200 and 500,000 throughout Europe. In Poland, the Roma were put in ghettos and then sent to concentration camps. In 1943 to 44, thousands of Roma were sent to Auschwitz. Many died of starvation, illness, and medical experiments. Interestingly, the Roma from Bulgaria, Denmark, Finland, and Greece were spared. August 2nd to 3rd is known as the Roma Holocaust Memorial Day because it was on that day that the women, children, and elderly Roma were killed in Auschwitz, a total of 2,800 97. Let's take a moment to learn about a Jewish composer who had great compassion for the gypsy, the Roma people. David Begelman is a connection between the Jews and the Roma. He was a composer who felt deep compassion for the Roma imprisoned in the Woj ghetto. Begelman was born to a musical family in Woj, where he composed and performed in Yiddish theaters at a young age. He became director of the Woj Yiddish Theater in 1912. He is the composer of Close Your Little Eyes, which the Temple Israel Choir members sing every year on Yom Kippur afternoon. I'm going to take a minute and play this beautiful piece for you. Mach zu die Egelech. Close your little eyes. Close your little eyes. Here come birds, they circle all around your head of your cradle with our luggage in our hand, the house is in ashes and embers. We are going, my child, to seek good fortune. David, Be David Begelman wrote the lyrics for this beautiful lullaby played in the Woj ghetto.
In 1940, David Begelman was forced to move to the Wodz ghetto, where he took part in the ghetto's cultural life as a conductor of the Wodz Orchestra. The ghetto's first symphony concert was performed under his direction on March 1st, 1941. The Wodge Ghetto had a designated area inside that held only the Roma. So it was literally a ghetto inside of a ghetto. David Begelman felt compassion for the Roma and composed Zigeinerlied, the gypsy song. So I'd like you to please listen to the song very carefully because I'm going to teach you how to sing it in a few minutes. Dark is the night, black as coal. And I think, and I think, and my heart beats. We gypsies live like no one else. We are in great need. There is barely enough bread. Zoom, zoom, zoom. We fly around like the seagulls, zoom, 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 and we play on the balalaika. This beautiful song by David Begelman is in two parts, a slow introduction and then a faster, a faster refrain. If you look at the lyrics, which are in Yiddish by David Begelman, you'll see that I've color coded them, color coded them. So the zoom, 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 the sound of the balalaika playing is all in red. The mir fliehen arum vidichaikis, we fly around like seagulls, comes twice in black. And we play on balalaikas, mir spielen euf di balalaikis is in blue. So everyone, could you unmute yourselves and we are going to be exquisitely um, non-synchronous when we practice this song. It's perfectly okay. <laughs> so repeat after me. Zoom, 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 zoom. ready, go. That was just as messy as I thought it would be. <laughs> very, very good. He's teaching us a song. Yes, repeat after me. Mir fli and arum vi di chaikes. Ready? Begin. Mir fli and arum vi di Beautiful. Zoom, 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 zoom. <laughs> Zoom, 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 and ready, go. Outstanding. Spielen euch die Balalaikes. Ready, begin. 
Superb. Zoom, 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 zoom. Ready? Your Yiddish is outstanding. Wir spielen euch die Balalaikes. Wir spielen euch die Balalaikes. Lovely. Repeat after me, listen first. Zoom, 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 zoom. Ready? Go. Zoom, 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 Good. Mir flee a room, be the chikes. Ready? In a room, be the chikes. Beautiful, perfect. Zoom, 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 zoom. Ready, go. Zoom, 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 zoom. Perfect. Mir spielen euch die Balalaikes. Yes, here's your first note. Mir spielen That was outstanding. Zoom, 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 zoom. Ready? Beautiful. Listen. Mir, mir, fli a room. Ready? Go. Mir, Coming to the end. Zoom, 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 zoom. Ready? Go. Zoom, 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 zoom. Listen, we're at the end. Mir spielen euch die Here's your first note. Mir spielen euch die that was wonderful. Now we're all going to sing or listen together, whichever you choose. Both are wonderful options. Could you mute yourselves now, please? And we're going to sing together. Here's you your want us to mute? Yes, please mute. And you will sound even more together if you are muted. It's amazing how that works. All right, so here's your first note. Zoom, 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 one, Two, ready, begin. Zoom, 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 zoom. Mir flee in a room, beat the chikes. Zoom, 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 zoom. Mir spielen with die Balalaikes. Zoom, 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 zoom. You're doing great. Near flee a room be the chikes. Zoom, 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 zoom. Mir spielen euch die Bala Laikes. Yeshikoach, beautiful everyone. Thank you. Thank you for singing or listening together. That was great. Let's listen to the voice of Roma Holocaust survivor, Margita Makulova. I actually found a YouTube recording of Margita singing a song that a Roma person composed while interned in Auschwitz. We don't know who the composer is, but we do have the lyrics. The song is called Lacho Drum, Safe Journey. And in English, it translates as, at Auschwitz, there is a big prison. There sits my lover. He sits, he sits and thinks. He forgets me. 
You, blackbird, take a letter for me. Go to my friend, to my wife. Tell her I am at Auschwitz. At Auschwitz, there is great famine. There is nothing to eat. What is there? Just a piece, a small piece of bread. The guard there is evil. So I'm going to close out this PowerPoint and bring you to the YouTube I'm going to come here. I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. Okay. Let's try it a different way. Thank you for your patience. Um, So in just a second, I'm going to bring it up for you. Thanks again for your patience. And here it is. In the beginning, you will hear a haunting train whistle. You'll see barbed wire. You'll hear the sweet voices of children singing Lacho Drum the Auschwitz song composed by a gypsy. And then you will see Mar Mar Margita singing the song. Notice that as the camera pans across her body, you'll see the number tattooed on her forearm. And the number is Z9267. Z of course is for Zigorner, gypsy.
That was Margita Makulova, an Auschwitz survivor of gypsy or more respectfully Roma descent. Let's take a moment just to reflect on what we just heard and how it was sung. As mostly Jewish people, we've heard our people, the Jewish survivors singing and we have sung their songs or we have heard these songs. Did you have any feelings or strong impressions hearing someone from gypsy descent, from a different cultural background, singing about being interned in Auschwitz? And if you have a comment or a thought, please just unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and let us know what you're thinking. Bob Dworkin? I just put in the chat that it was very uh, poignant, mm -hmm. made me sad, very moving, and it uh, brought tears to my eyes. Thank you, Bob. This is Dave Melman. Um, seemed to me like the the person had lost all hope. They mm. were just stuck in the situation that they were in. Mm. Thank you for um, thank you for that, Dave. Thank you very much. The voice is so expressive. you can hear that hopelessness, yes. Yeah. And Shelley Goldstein just um, posted a chat about the pain in her voice. The chat just disappeared, but thank you for that, Shelley. Can we have one more comment? Actually, Susie. <laughs> oh, Susie, thank I you. I don't know why it disappeared, but okay. <laughs> Susie, can you um, can you um, share your thoughts with us? No, well, uh, that's what I wrote. I, I just felt that I could feel the pain in her voice as she was singing. You know, it's, it was very sad and you can feel it. Right. The sound of her voice is very evocative, isn't uh, it? Yes. Yeah, thank you, Susie. It's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. um, man's inhumanity to man. To, to man. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tammy. Was that a picture of her husband? Say that person? again, please. Was that a picture of her husband? Um, I didn't see what you saw. I'm sorry, was there a picture of a man? Yes, she was holding a photo. Um, I believe that was a picture on a cigarette package. Oh, uh, okay. It was, yeah, yeah. But you know, with survivors, um, you never know how a face or a picture or a memento might affect them. So. Of all the different brands of cigarettes, she might have felt some sort of connection to that face. We don't know. But it's a very poignant thing that you said. Are you, Ivan? Yes, thank you, Ivan. It was a very poignant um, observation. She may have felt some sort of connection with the face on that package. Thank you for that. Um, if you have other thoughts, um, if you could please save them until the end, I'm going to share another YouTube with you. And um, this YouTube is of Dr. Petra Gelbart, a descendant of survivors. Of Roma descent. And let's see if I can share my screen and do this. Oh, isn't it nice when it works? Can everyone see? Yes, wonderful. So let me tell you about Petra Gelbart. I had the honor of meeting her about 12 years ago at a workshop she was giving. 
Dr. Petra Gelbar is associated with New York University. She was born in Czechoslovakia and is the granddaughter and grandniece of Holocaust survivors. Dr. Gelbart was introduced to the Romani language, music, and culture at a very young age. Her personal background drove her passion to study Romani culture further and to become an educator in Romani music, history, and other socio-political issues. Dr. Gelbart said, my family's experience during the Holocaust was the primary motivator in my decision to become involved in commemoration efforts. Increasingly, I am also coming to terms with how much this background has shaped my personal identity and psychological makeup. She is um, the co-founder of the Initiative for Romani Music at NYU. So now Dr. Petra Gelbart is going to sing that exact same song, but notice how she sings it. And after we listen to her beautiful voice, we're going to reflect on how she sang it compared to um, Margita. This is about a three minute YouTube and she also brings slides into her performance. She's speaking Romani right now. Thank you for listening. So we heard Margita, the survivor, sing it, and we heard Dr. Petra Gelbart sing it. It was the same song, but I'm wondering, as you compare the two interpretations, 
did you hear any similarities or differences or, or what did you sense from the two interpretations? And please announce yourself and, and speak up when you're ready. Tamara, I had trouble hearing you. Is anybody else having a problem? Yes, yeah. we do have a problem. Couldn't hear it. Did not hear it. You couldn't hear the you couldn't hear the song? No, Tamara, your microphone seems to be quieter. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. All right. So if if you would like to reflect on Dr. Petra Gelbart's interpretation, please uh, let us know who's speaking and, um, and please um, just uh, share your thoughts. You still need to turn it up a little bit. Okay. Yeah, Tamara, we can't, we can't, can't hear you well at all. Okay. You sound muted. Oh my goodness. It's not muted, no, we can hear you, but it's soft. All right, I will try to speak louder. Is that better? Not really. Not really. Okay. Well, we have one more <coughs> to come. So um, you do the talking and I'll do the listening. <laughs> yeah, this is Ann. Um, I think there's a level of personal pain in, in the first, um, I mean, you can really almost see her going back and experiencing what she went through. Mm -hmm. um, Petra's performance is absolutely beautiful, but it's, it's a respectful performance. It's sort of the way I think that we do, in a sense, the Holocaust music of Jews, which is we were not there, but we need to share and respect what happened. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Anne, can you hear me? Anyone else? I agree with Anne, exactly what she said. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. I can't. Let's then, um, uh, move on. I just wanted to comment that um, Dr. Petra Gelbart seemed to me to really be in Auschwitz while she was singing. There was so much pain and emotion in her voice. She was feeling it so deeply, so personally, and she just put so much of herself into her interpretation. Um, let's take a moment and listen to the music of the Dutch Roma musician named Roger Moreno Rotgeb, who composed the Requiem for Auschwitz to commemorate his Roma people from the Nazi victims. Like many Roma musicians, Rotgeb is self-taught at a later age he learned how to make um, staff notations and compose his own works on staff paper. He composed a 60 minute composition for symphony orchestra, choir and soloists. He started working on this around the year 2000. He then went to Auschwitz himself and then he was completely blocked after that. He was so traumatized from visiting the concentration camp. By the end of 2007, the International Gypsy Festival asked him to complete his composition so that it could be performed in various European cities. He was honored and inspired by this request. And by the middle of 2009, he finished his Requiem. Let's listen to a little bit of Rotgeb's Requiem.
and we're going to listen to part of a movement called Agnus Dei, Lamb of God. And I know you're having trouble hearing me, but I hope that you hear this beautiful music. Mary, your, your sound uh, increased substantially. Uh, the past couple much minutes. better. It's uh, much better. I'll stop shouting. Thank you. No, you're not shouting. <laughs> okay. That's perfect. Thank you for letting me know. And by the way, this orchestra is um, conducted by, um, uh, by a Roma conductor. And um, most of the musicians in this European orchestra are Roma people. And um, it was recorded in Budapest on November 6, 2012 at the Bela Bartok Concert Hall. Let's give it a listen.
Thank you for sharing that powerful piece with me. The conductor was Ricardo Saiti. I couldn't remember his name, but I realized that. Thank you for sharing that with me. And it's a piece that's relatively new to me, and I feel that it's a significant discovery. The fact that the Roma are so beautifully represented and remembered and honored and loved through that piece of music, I think is a significant thing. Um, what I'm going to do is um, finish my uh, program for tonight by pulling up um, my slides uh, and we'll finish up in a few minutes. You've been a wonderful, wonderful audience. Thank Can I you. make a comment? Sure, Bob. Okay. Go ahead. I, I just thought that the, the whole piece was almost like a prayer. It was just so beautifully done. Uh, and the uh, violin soloist uh, was hauntingly reminding me of the violins uh, from uh, Schindler's List. Yes, thank you for that, Bob. The, that first violin is the concertmaster of Roma descent. Um, his solo was so beautiful, wasn't it? And it had the flavor of, of gypsy music in it, which was so impactful. Thank you, Bob. Any other comments? Yeah, Tamara? Yes. Debbie, hi. hi yeah, Debbie. it was so beautiful. Um, I, I almost felt like it was a conversation. You know, it had this one motif, the repetitive theme that <laughs> kept coming with solo winds, the flute, the um, bassoon, the violin, and, and like almost like people were answering each other back and forth. That's a lovely way to hear it, Debbie. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't think of it that way. And now that you say it, it seems so natural and so obvious. Beautiful, a beautiful interpretation. Thank you. Well, I'm sorry, did someone want to speak? Yes, uh, Tamara, it's Susie again. Hi, um, I just wanted to say that um, I really enjoyed that gypsy music. I came from a Hungarian background. My parents owned a Hungarian resort in the Catskill Mountains and we had gypsy musicians playing up there. Um, and it's a total contrast to what I was used to because the gypsy music um, that I heard heard as a young child was very fast and quick and lively. So it's a um, it was an interesting contrast to hear this. It was beautiful, especially this last piece. So I just wanted to comment on that. I'm so glad that you did, Susie. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's Linda Shanker. Um, yeah. I was not aware that they are, that the, the Roma were, were Christian because, you know, a requiem is a, is a, a Christian mass piece. Yes, um, the Roma followed Catholicism. It's very interesting, isn't it? Um, may I please also say yeah. something in this context? My name is Mila and I'm from Bulgaria. Uh, Romans, uh, the Romas would follow probably the religion on, depending on which territory they inhabit. For example, in Bulgaria, they are Christians. Uh, along the a little um, enclaves of um, uh, Bulgarian Muslims, the Romans are Muslims. <laughs> mm. So I guess in Western and Central Europe, they're Catholics. Mm -hmm. uh, and probably in, in, in America, they're secular. <laughs> I have no idea, but uh, it's, it's, it's diverse, my point is. They're, they're not Catholic everywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you for adding that information. That's, that's very, it's very helpful and enlightening. Thank you. Um, if you're raising your hand, I, I can't see you just because of the way my Zoom screen is organized. But if you would like to say something, just please introduce yourself. Tamara, it's Gloria Rubin. Hi, Gloria. Hi, Rabbi Gloria. 
Hi, I was curious to know more about their language. Mm. Um, I wish that I could speak, um, speak to that. Um, I, in all honesty, I cannot. Um, if you um, look up Dr. Petra Gelbart, um, she writes a lot of information online. There's a lot of information that she's written online about the language. But I'm glad that you asked that question. That's a very important question. And um, let's say that for next week's uh, class, um, if anyone is interested in, in studying that more, do a little um, uh, reading or a little research and let's reconvene and answer that question together next week. Thank you, Rabbi Gloria. Thank you. So here is a picture of the composer of that magnificent um, Requiem, Roger Moreno Ratgeb, is part Roma and part Dutch. And to end our evening together, I want to introduce you to this Roma Auschwitz survivor. Her name is Shea Sota, and I became acquainted with her um, first in a New York Times article about half a year ago. And this is a picture from that article. Shea's family had lived in Austria for 200 years. She was the fourth of five children. Between 1940 and 44, the Roma were forced to registers, register as members of another race. Their campground was fenced off and they were placed under police guard. Shea was only eight when the Germans took her father away. A few months later, her mother received his ashes in a box. Next, the Germans took Chea's sister, Kathy. Finally, they were all deported to a Roma camp in Birkenau. They lived in the shadows of a smoking crematorium and they called the path in front of their barracks, the highway to hell. Shea was subsequently freed in the Bergen-Belsen camp in 1945. After the war, she documented uh, the Holocaust through songs that she composed and particularly her artwork. Shea started to do artwork at the age of 56, documenting scenes from Auschwitz. She used unconventional painting implements like her fingers and toothpicks. Shea said that she, quote, worked everything that came between her fingers, including cardboard, glass jars, postcards, and spalt dough. I'd like to show you a picture that Shea um, painted. She only painted on cardboard and she painted hundreds of scenes from Auschwitz. And the Roma people have many different interpretations uh, regarding crows and blackbirds. And so in the background, we can see a very dense, almost a, a fog of, of blackbirds. And then the Auschwitz the, the base to the Auschwitz Tower, or perhaps it's a gallows, and the smoke in the background. Is there any part of this painting that speaks to you? And could you tell us why? Any detail of the painting that you notice? Mart, it's Susie again. Uh, it's very interesting that she put in so much green grass and very, very deep green. Mm -hmm. um, you think of growth and um, I was just thinking if that represented some kind of a hope, mm. you know, like, uh, you know, I don't know, the grass is greener on the other side or just that, it, 
you know, the grass is so thick and growing um, yeah. that maybe there was hope for a better future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Thank you, Susie. That's a beautiful interpretation. Thank you very much. No one has ever made that comment before. Thank you for that. I just need, I feel the need to embellish that a little and say that the grass, that's vibrant. Mm -hmm. It feels like it's growing right before my eyes. Mm -hmm. And then the black crows on the top are the exact opposite. And then I, it looks to me more like a gallows than a guard tower. Mm -hmm. But, and of course the name Auschwitz in white clearly indicating, and that sort of, you know, you, you, you come out of the, the fervent, beautiful, lively grass into the Auschwitz and then you're left with black crows hovering around. Uh, it's quite a piece of art. I, I think it's beautiful. Thank you, Gary, for, um, for making comments about the contrast that is um, a beautiful interpretation. And if um, if you don't know Barry, he is my darling husband. So <laughs> not always <laughs> darling, but I try my best. <laughs> so thank you for that, Barry. I thought I heard someone else who wanted to yeah. speak up. Hi, Tamara. It's Sally. Um, sorry, I came late to the to the program. Uh, but did you say this was painted after? Yes. So it almost looks to me. It feels to me like the death had occurred and the grass is growing over it. Are we to forget what happened underneath that grass? Mm. What's, what's nurturing that grass to be so vibrant? Mm. And is it, the, is it the death? Is it the, the underneath? Mm -hmm. Is there life? Mm. Anyway, that's what I, I took from it. Wow, Sally, that is very, very powerful. Thank you for that. Thank you. And Sally, um, welcome. We, um, I know that you needed to arrive late. You, you were giving a talk tonight. <laughs> yes. Sally's father um, is the author of the book that I mentioned before. And so Sally, thank you again for this beautiful book and for helping, uh, giving us an opportunity to remember your father, Jack of blessed memory. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. This has been an amazing program. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. We have time for uh, one more comment. Ivan Silver. Hi. Hello, oh. Ivan. Good evening. Uh, yeah, I, I think this painting talks to me about hope. Mm. And in the face of the camp, mm. that, uh, that it, you can still have the ability, they can't imprison your mind. Mm. And so you, you, can, you can imagine what the future might look like. Mm. Ivan, thank you very much for sharing that. And you've touched upon a salient point for this evening's program. The fact that while people were imprisoned, they needed to be creative. Being creative was a, it was a means toward survival, at least in that moment. And um, music and, and art were a, a means toward sol solace and spiritual resistance. So thank you very much for, for your thoughts. They're so appropriate for tonight. Well, it's, it's getting a little bit late and um, I just wanted um, to show you one last um, slide representing the music of the Roma people. This was taken in Auschwitz and um, these are Roma musicians playing in the hot blazing sun. And one of the things that strikes me about this particular photograph is that the two boys in the foreground are playing instruments that are much too big for them. And um, they probably didn't have instruments that were the correct size, perhaps even before the Shoah, but 
to me, that symbolizes that the burden of the Holocaust was so overwhelming for everyone, but particularly for the children who perished. And I wonder who took this picture and why were they standing at this particular angle? Does anyone have any thoughts about that? Well, I will let you um, think about that over um, the evening and perhaps through the week. And when we come back together again on March 23rd, um, I think we'll begin with just a little bit more Roma um, exploration, just a little bit, because some questions were asked tonight and I think they, they merit um, truthful answers. So next week we'll begin with a little bit of a better understanding of the Roma language. But next week, we're going to explore the music of the Jewish composer and singer of Auschwitz named Alexander Kulisevich. It was because of his um, surviving the Holocaust that we have an enormous wealth of music that documented the events of the Holocaust as they were happening in Auschwitz. And I can bring you to sound sound recordings of Alexander singing his songs. I'm also going to introduce you to a Jehovah's Witness from Sachsenhausen named Erich Hugo Frost. He composed a very important song of spiritual resistance. We're going to hear his men's choir of Jehovah's Witnesses singing his song and learn about his life and heroism. He did survive the Holocaust and his song is still sung today. I'll be playing more of my viola next week and introducing you to so much more music. And for tonight, I just want to say thank you very much for attending the program. It was lovely to see you and hear your voices, your singing voices and your, your speaking voices and your spiritual voices. Thank you. Stay well and stay All right. safe. Thank you. Thank you, know, thank you. Thank you very thank much, you. Tamara, thank for an you. excellent program. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Can I we make will, a uh, comment, Tamara? Thank you. Will be next, next two Tuesdays. We hope that you can join us. On behalf of uh, Temple Israel, I want to express my thanks to Tamara for an outstanding job and uh, learned a lot about a portion of the Holocaust that I didn't know. And I hope everyone else. Um, did get more than they anticipated. So it was very worthwhile. Thank you all oh, yeah. for us tonight. And Thank if you have you. any further questions, feel free to share them with tomorrow now. Yes, um, I'm sitting right here. I'm so I'm happy to, to continue talking. Bob, thank you very much for all of your wonderful help. 